Hi, everyone, and welcome to our next Meet the Team event. These events are opportunities to meet and talk with members of the OET Core of Exploration and learn about the areas of science, technology, engineering, and exploration that excite them. For everyone watching on Facebook and YouTube, you'll be able to ask questions uh, by adding comments and questions below. We would also love to know where you're watching some from, so feel free to throw that in as well. The core of exploration is made up of people from around the world with different backgrounds and interests. Uh, and with these events, we want you to gain an insider's look at the different careers and people that we sail with. Today's event is featuring Taylor Ann Smith, a former ocean science intern on EV Nautilus, who is coming back on board this season as a science manager in training. Hi, Taylor Ann. Hi, how's it going, Kelly? Great, thank you. I'm so glad you could join us today. Uh, can you tell everyone uh, where you're coming from and what school you go to and maybe how you got interested in science? Yeah. So I grew up actually in the Midwest, so far, far away from the ocean. Um, but I always had an interest um, in marine science and in nature in general. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. Um, and I've struggled with what I wanted to do. Uh, I started off wanting to be in pre-veterinary science and then pre-medicine, um, and then even switched my major over to telecommunications because I had an interest in like documentary making. Um, so I ended up switching my major to general biology um, after watching a, a documentary called Mission Blue uh, featuring Dr. Sylvia Earle. Um, and I realized that, yeah, I had a passion for ocean science and I wanted to help protect um, the ocean. And when I was at Ball State, um, right before I graduated, I actually had the opportunity to meet Dr. Earle. Um, and right before I left, I got um, a scholarship to attend Duke University, um, where I actually got my first experience in marine science. Um, I was able to uh, conduct my own independent research there, take some classes for graduate credit, um, and made some really good connections there. Um, so I got into to the actual feel of what it was like to be a marine scientist there um, and met some amazing people. Uh, so from there, um, I got led to the experience about, about being aboard the Nautilus um, from my uh, mentor, uh, Dr. Cindy Vandover, who was actually uh, the first female to pilot the Alvin submarine. Um, she was very, very kind to me and <laughs> listened to me and answered all of my nerdy questions about the deep sea and told me about the Nautilus and said, you know, the best way to answer all these questions you have about the deep sea is just to go see it yourself. Um, and so I took that opportunity to apply um, and I got the internship and it's been the most amazing experience so far. Um, now I'm a, a student at Cal State Northridge getting my master's degree in marine biology in Dr. Carrie Nichols lab, um, where we focus on ecological oceanography. Um, and I love being a part of this uh, university and the lab that I'm in. Uh, it gives me a great opportunity to expand upon my skills um, and to kind of collaborate with other people. So uh, I look forward to talking to you guys about my um, current research um, with microplastics in the deep sea. Um, and I'm extending that research to study microplastics and kelp forest ecosystems as well. That's awesome. I love that your pathway has taken you kind of on a few different directions to get to where you are today, as I think a lot of students can resonate with that and maybe not knowing exactly what they want to go to school for. But finding those pathways and finding those mentors that really help connect them to the areas of study that they want to get into. And with that, can you talk a little bit about what you're studying now, microplastics and pollution? And when did you know that that's what you wanted to study and um, kind of your pathway to get to the lab that you're in currently? Yeah. Uh, so at first I wasn't sure what I wanted to study because my interests in marine science are so wide. Um, and the experiences that I had also matched uh, that wide uh, array of interests. Um, so I started off um, just questioning all the different systems and things that I like to study um, in the past. Uh, and then I was aboard the Nautilus when I heard um, a scientist talking about persistent organic pollutants, which is something I had heard about but didn't really know much about. Um, and then we got on a conversation about um, microplastics and how microplastics can carry toxic chemicals um, and pollutants on their surfaces. Um, and so that really struck an interest with me. And um, so then I just, you know, started asking questions about where are my plastics, uh, kind of what effects do they have on organisms um, and how many are out there and just 
reading different papers and watching different shows and seeing that microplastics are a huge issue. Um, it made me want to study more of how they persist in different ecosystems and environments. Um, so I will first be looking at Um, so this won't be any deep sea research, um, but this will be um, done closer to shore um, because the presence of the canopies of kelp actually causes the physical environment to change. So water is flowing a lot more slowly um, through these ecosystems it's in one place for a lot longer period of time. Um, so potentially maybe microplastics could be accumulating there. Um, and then we also want to know, um, because we love the deep sea and we want to protect the life there, um, how persistent these microplastics are in the deep sea um, and seeing how that changes as a function of depth um, and farther out you get away from shore, the mainland, um, and just seeing the different types that are out there and where they're coming from. So microplastics are any type of small pieces of plastic under five millimeters in size, and they range from fragment pieces, which break down um, from larger pieces of plastic, like we see garbage at the surface of the ocean, um, that will break down uh, over time because every piece of plastic that's been created, it will always exist in some form. It won't disintegrate completely. Um, so you can have these fragments um, in the water, or you can also have microplastics that necessarily have broken down, um, but were actually created to be microplastics. So an example of this would be small little microbeads in your face washes or toothpaste. Um, these are intentionally made, um, and every time we wash our face with these products or brush our teeth, all of these microplastics are being washed down the drain. Another popular um, or uh, wide um, uh, microplastic that we know about that comes from us uh, that was intentionally made to be small uh, is microfibers. So when we wear clothing that is derived from plastic because it's so cheap to produce, um, we are washing all these microfibers down the drain. Uh, so when we're washing our fleece jackets that are really fuzzy and nice and soft and cute, but they're made out of plastic materials, each time we wash those jackets, microfibers are actually being released. Um, so washers don't really have filters in them to collect these microplastics um, and these microfibers. Um, so that's possibly one solution that we could look into is getting filters um, placed in our washers um, to help collect them. But one thing is that can be pretty expensive. Um, but there are like different bags that you can put your clothing in um, that will collect the microplastics while you're washing them. Wow, that is crazy. But <laughs> there's not just the you know, microplastics coming from larger pieces of plastic. It's actually a lot of other materials that are just breaking down to form these super, super tiny pieces that are now in the ocean that the human eye cannot see. Mm -hmm. Is do people who live in the middle of the country who maybe aren't living near an ocean, are their plastics and their fibers of clothes that they're wearing, is that also affecting the ocean? And kind of how can people help in this situation of what you're studying and how you know can we help so that way your job is not as challenging in finding these plastics? Yeah, of course. Um, so I grew up in the Midwest and I never really had an immediate connection, I guess, with the ocean, um, but it does it does impact of water. These microplastics aren't only in the water, but you can see them flying in the air. Sometimes when you see little fuzzies flying in the air and you're like, so you microplastic. Um, so they're all around us um, and everything that we do um, can actually, you know, contribute to the microplastic. trying to avoid using them um, and to use uh, like, instead of like plastic water bottles, use aluminum. Um, and these microplastics don't just end up in the ocean, they end up in rivers um, and in lakes as well. Wow, and we're getting some viewers who are commenting saying that they have to now switch their face cleaners or they had no idea about fleece. So. Uh, I think we're opening up some people's eyes on just what is out there that is an everyday use that maybe we're not thinking about in terms of what's getting to the ocean and now what do we have to do to kind of fix that. Um, I know you're going to be studying microplastics on the upcoming expedition on EV Nautilus that you're about to head out to. How exactly are you going to be doing this from the ship? What are you going to be using to help take samples? And kind of what is your process while you're on board to help take these samples and help process them? 
Yeah. Um, so I really would love to see how the concentrations and types of microplastics are changing um, as a function of depth and in the different vertical um, parts of the water column. Um, so as you're going through the water column from the surface down to the deep ocean, the properties of that water changes drastically. Um, so I want to see how the concentrations and types of microplastics change according to those different water mass properties that you're seeing change. Um, so I will be using the five liter Niskin bottles um, on the ROV Hercules um, to collect water samples uh, throughout the different areas of the water column um, to collect this water and filter it onto little filters that I will then use um, to look at under a fancy machine called a micro FTIR um, to kind of analyze those microplastics and see what types that we're actually finding. Um, and just for an example of what a Niskin looks like, I have a 1.7 liter Niskin here. Um, so this one I'll be using at the surface um, to collect water samples at the start and end of each dive. Uh, and I will also be using a zooplankton tow net um, to collect the little micro, this tiny little zooplankton um, that you know of that a lot of organisms feed on. Um, I'll be collecting those and then digesting them or breaking them down to see if they're ingesting microplastics. Um, in addition to those sampling uh, methods, I will be uh, collecting either sea pens or sea pigs, holothurians, um, to see if they're also ingesting microplastics. Um, because that's really important. If these organisms are ingesting microplastics and it can harm them, we want to know what's going on here. Uh, so the main issue with plastics is that they're traveling through our food webs. So if they're very, very tiny, even the smallest organism could be ingesting them. Um, this could be passed up through the food web um, all the way up to fish and potentially up to humans. And along with these microplastics could potentially be chemicals that we do not want to consume in the tissues of um, the fish that we eat. Um, so I'll also be collecting potentially some sediment samples to see um, which microplastic will be settling into the sediments of the deep sea. Uh, and yeah, just trying to get a wide profile of different um, types of samples to see where these microplastics are, what types are there, and how many are there. Um, so I'll be doing this across different sites from Monterey Bay to the Channel Islands. And Wow, so it, you have a lot to do while you're on board. Uh, we do have a question from a viewer on YouTube, uh, Sergio, who's asking, isn't there a study on some bacteria that's also able to digest plastic? Have you heard of this? And is this something that maybe you have other scientists that, you're, uh, that you know of that is studying that? possible. We have lost Taylor Ann for a second. Let me just see if she comes back online. But in the meantime, uh, if anyone has any other questions on Facebook or YouTube, feel free to type them in below uh, and we'll try to get to as many as possible during this segment. Um, Taylor Ann, I'm not sure. I'm glad that we have you back, but I'm not sure if you heard the question. Um, we have a viewer on YouTube who's wondering if you've heard of, and um, if you know anyone who's doing a study on bacteria that's able to digest plastic. I'm not sure I caught the whole question, but I think, yeah, I think I did. Okay, I can see it. Uh, sorry, I lost connection there for a second. No problem. Um, yes. I have heard about this study um, and that's actually some really interesting research that I'm really looking forward to following. Um, but yeah, that would be really beneficial to know um, if this is possible because all these microplastics that are already in bacteria that do digest them. And that, that has been uh, studied, um, particularly in the deep sea, I believe. Wow. So once you collect all of these samples that you have, what's your process to then look for these microplastics in the water or in the sediment or in the biological samples that you're taking? I know you are taking a lot. So how then do you bring them back to your lab and what kind of is your process on processing them to find these plastics? 
Yeah. So if it's a water sample, it's as simple as um, filtering it through this thing called a filter pump um, onto a small filter um, that will collect and trap all of the microplastics on them. Um, and then I'll be looking at that under a special machine and microscope. Um, but if it's an organism, like a biological organism, um, say like a sea pen or a zooplankton, um, they will be chemically digested or broken down. Um, and this will be done over perhaps like a 24 hour period um, where all the organic material will break down. So there will still be some stuff left behind like sand um, and other um, materials that won't necessarily break down, but they'll be a lot smaller. Um, but then I will filter this material as well um, and then use the micro FTIR machine to um, identify the different um, micro pieces that we see on there to determine if they are plastic and if they are, what types of plastic are we seeing? Um, and then just also taking note of the morphology of the different plastics, because um, even the type of plastic that you see and the shape that they are um, will affect how they sink and how they move. Um, so if you have like a round microplastic versus a flat, thin microplastic, um, it'll float around differently. Um, so that's something that we want to take into consideration too in the future um, is how these microplastics are moving around. Um, and yeah, just kind of tying in the physics as well into the, the biological studies that we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we do have a viewer who's asking, how do these animals uptake plastic? So how are they ingesting the plastic and how do we even know that they're in the organisms? Yeah. Um, so we have seen uh, studies with so plankton, so these small organisms um, that are ingesting microplastics, um, and we can use different things like dyes um, to look at these living organisms while they're still alive to see if the microplastics are inside of their digestive tracts. Um, and we have found this, um, and we've seen this travel up the food web from these small zooplankton um, to other organisms like fish. We've even seen it in oysters and mussels. Um, and this is traveling all the way up the food chain uh, because you have small organisms that are getting fed on by bigger organisms um, and that travels its way up. You can also see microplastics moving around um, through like uh, organisms' feces. So if they have ingested it and it might not necessarily stay behind in their tissues, um, if they are releasing feces with these microplastics, um, they can travel from all over. So microplastics that are on the surface, um, they can either accumulate um, density or become more dense um, with uh, bioaccumulation or organic material like uh, t growing on the surface of these microplastics, allowing them to be heavier and causing them to sink. Um, so when you're seeing the dives and you see some um, white fuzzy stuff in the water column as we're going down, this is known as marine snow. Um, and microplastics could be aggregating on the, the particles of marine snow that are falling as well. Um, and organisms that feed higher up in the water column could be traveling around um, and eating other organisms and releasing feces. And it, it just kind of spreads these microplastics in multiple ways. Um, so you have these filter feeders that could be eating, feeding in the water column and don't really distinguish the difference between a little particle uh, of organic material versus a small particle of plastic. Uh, they can't tell the difference. It seems like this is a lot of work for you to have to do to take the samples, find all of these plastics, in, you know, in the sediment, in the water, and the organisms. I'm curious, what do you love most about this work? Uh, now that you found kind of your passion and what you're going to be studying as your future career, uh, what do you love most about it? And, you know, if there's anyone watching that also is really interested in it, what do you love that can then have hopefully other people who are interested in this love as well? Yeah, um, I think my biggest love is just the sense of being a child and exploring my curiosity with science. So uh, my passion for science arose from just being a curious kid outside, poking my fingers in things and just exploring and asking random questions. And I think that's my favorite part of science is that you can take that childlike curiosity and turn it into a career by scientifically asking, you know, why is this happening? Or what can I do to make this better? Um, and I have a passion to uh, just help in any way that I can, whether that's people, whether that's inspiring other people to pursue their career goals, um, or just protecting the ocean. Um, that is one thing that I've been super passionate about. So it doesn't matter what career I end up taking. It's just um, that I want to uh, spread the knowledge that I have and share that with other people. Um, and one way that I do this is through events like this, where I can share my knowledge and inspire people and talk about the things that I know um, and tell them that they can do the same thing. Um, so it was really hard becoming a marine scientist um, and it still is. It's really hard to find your pathway sometimes out here. Um, when you see so many people 
uh, in these career fields that are so successful and doing such great things, you're like, wow, could I even do that? Um, and I had all those same doubts and questions. And there were so many times I applied for internships um, that I told I was told I was a finalist for and I thought I was going to get it. And I was, you know, studying in uh, the Midwest and had no connection to the ocean. And I kept getting told no for all these marine science experiences. Or if I got told yes, they were really expensive and my family couldn't afford it. Um, and I just kept pushing forward. I just kept applying for things and leading with my passion forward um, and not letting the, the nose determine my fate, but just deciding that, you know what, I'm gonna keep being passionate about what I'm passionate about um, and keep trying. Um, and it eventually worked out. It might've been my last year of undergrad when I finally got that break, um, but it happened. Um, and I encourage anybody that's interested in marine science or in any field um, not to give up just because it's, it's challenging, um, but to find uh, your own pathway. Uh, so like, I know a lot of people that lived in the Midwest that wanted to study marine science, um, and it's very hard to make that connection, um, but you have to learn how to carve your own paths, unfortunately. Um, but I want to use um, my ability to be able to do that, um, to show people that they can do the same thing. Um, and hopefully, maybe some people won't have to, maybe I can share my story and it'll make things a little bit easier for someone else to figure out how to navigate their dreams and uh, how to keep pushing forward despite of any obstacles that they come um, to face. That was a great answer. And we <laughs> also have a really great comment from a viewer on YouTube, Ocean Heart Art, uh, who just want, I just want you to be able to see it too. It's um, seeing someone like you is so inspiring and you kind of already touched on these and answered these questions, but for high school students, uh, do you have any other advice for them who are just starting out in their college, you know, future college careers uh, kind of what advice do you have for them as they're just starting that process of now going to college or um, or figuring out what career they want to do next? Yeah, um, I would say be true to who you are. Don't worry about everyone else and what they're doing and comparing yourself to the accomplishments of others, but rather focus on the things that you're good at. I saw your, your image there. It looked like a drawing. Uh, I also love to draw and I love art. Um, and that's something that I have tried to use to separate myself apart from everyone else. Um, just like, hey, I can use this as a tool to communicate science as well. So trying to discover all those non-traditional kind of pathways that you could, um, you know, contribute to the field of science. Um, just, I guess, bank on that. You know, don't doubt you. Um, utilize the things that you have and the things that you are good at and the things that you're passionate about. Um, you can you can do it. I know it's going to be hard. In high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> I, I changed my mind all the time, um, but that's okay. Uh, it, it's a part of the growth process, um, and eventually, uh, you'll be able to see how those things benefit you benefited you in the future. That's awesome. Thank you for answering that question. Uh, do you plan on using your art or doing any art while you're at sea on this expedition? Yeah, of course. Um, last year, I actually did a doodle of um, one of the octopus uh, that we saw in the octopus garden. Um, but yeah, I always doodle uh, while I'm on board. If I have free time, I'd love to doodle or write poetry. Um, so hopefully I'll see something that inspires me out there uh, this year to kind of just doodle um, and express uh, what I'm feeling or thinking. Um, I think art is an excellent, uh, excellent communication tool um, to, to bring everybody into the conversation. Um, not everybody's a scientist. Not everybody can understand scientific papers. Uh, and that's something that I still even struggle with sometimes. Um, but finding a way to communicate those more complicated and difficult things in a way that everybody can understand by just visually looking at something, uh, I think that's an excellent tool um, that I'm still learning how to, to combine with my science, um, but it's something that I'm really passionate about and I look forward to, to doing. Great, thanks. And we're getting a few more questions about microplastics, so uh, love to ask you a couple more. Um, we do have a Facebook viewer who's asking, how long do microplastics travel? As in how long until they reach the deepest parts of the ocean and even where we're going to study when you're on board uh, in the next few weeks, how long does it take for them to actually get there? Yeah, so that, I definitely do not know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, but um, one thing to, to consider when you're asking that kind of question is what's going on in the water? Um, what is the velocity like? What kind of structures are there? Um, are there large rock structures that could um, alter the flow of the water around you? Um, 
are the microplastics fresh or are they old? Do they have um, organic material on them? All of these different things can change how long it takes from a, for a microplastic to travel from the top to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and once it gets there, um, it's probably gonna stay there depending on how much flow I guess is around in the environment. But typically in the deep sea, there's not much crazy amounts of flow down there. Um, at least when we've been uh, on the Nautilus, I see like things are pretty, like the sediment's pretty stuck uh, so we don't uh, really know, well, at least I don't know, um, how long it would take. Um, it depends on the type of microplastic um, and what environment that you're in and how the water flow is looking there. Because right. if it's really turbulent, you know, they can be mixed around and taken a lot farther out as compared to farther down. Um, it just depends. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one awesome thing about science is that as you're starting to you know, do more research on this topic and others are doing more research now that we know that there's so much plastic in our oceans, uh, not knowing the answer to certain questions helps you actually lead you to the answers so you can do more research to try and to answer these questions that you guys all don't know about, which is uh, something I think a lot of scientists can agree with that it's not always one answer or that you know the answer right away. Uh, we have another question coming in on do microplastics in ocean water columns affect fish population hormones. So do the plastics that the fish are eating, does that affect their hormones? Uh, that's a good question. So I have seen studies where um, organisms that have ingested microplastics um, have been negatively impacted in the way that um, uh, that they it impacts their reproduction um, and their development. Um, so uh, I'm not too sure uh, about the hormones, but that's a really good question. Um, I would assume Potentially, yeah. Um, I think that um, that's a really good question and something that if you're interested in research, that's a good question to ask. We, everyone's really interested in this topic. Now uh, on YouTube, we also have another question. Um, do forums incorporate microplastics in their shells? So can mm -hmm. shellfish or can things that have shells on them, can they also get microplastics and plastics into their systems and on their shells? Oh, I'm sure. Um, so one thing that I'm also interested in studying is, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, kelp um, and seeing how uh, microplastics can potentially be adhering to the surfaces of kelp. And one organism that feeds on kelp um, are these small little snails that like to, to eat the blades of kelp, um, which uh, have been seen to actually ingest microplastics, um, depending on what like where they are. Um, I know some other species of uh, algae, fucus, um, vesiculosis was fed on by a small snail um, and they actually ingested the microplastics. Um, and I'd assume, you know, if an organism has something sticky on its surface, it can stick to it. Uh, the microplastics could stick to it, um, especially if there's crevices and different things that uh, microplastics could be on. Uh, yeah, it's totally possible. Is this your first at sea experience with collecting samples for microplastics in the deep sea? Or have you, you know, gone out on other ships before to take samples in your lab that you're currently in? Or have you done more shallow water and this is maybe your first opportunity at the deep sea? Yeah, this is my first opportunity in the deep sea. Um, last year when I was aboard um, as a science intern, um, I just processed all the samples that came through the lab. Um, I wasn't out there collecting my own, so this will be a really great experience. Um, and I have the help of um, my advisor, Dr. Kerry Nichols, and uh, mentor and advisor, Dr. Claire Steele, who works with microplastics to help me with all of my methods and processes uh, of how to collect these microplastics and process them um, to get all the data that we're interested in. So now that you are going to be a science manager in training and not an intern on board EV Nautilus, kind of what are you most excited to, you know, experience this time around? Uh, I'm sure last year maybe it was a little bit more nerve wracking because it was your first time on board. But, you know, being a science manager in training, what are you kind of most looking forward to going out this time? I really love the connection with all of the, the, the team members on the Nautilus. Um, and I think since I won't be as nervous this time, I'll be able to make uh, more genuine connections. Um, I know uh, Dr. Nicole, uh, she, she was really great um, and really kind and friendly to me um, during my time on, on a board last year. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to kind of letting go of the nerves and kind of, I guess, relaxing a little bit more and being more present in the process of collection and just getting a little thing, things more streamlined and more comfortable um, with the things that I already know, but just, uh, I guess, getting a little bit better at them. Uh, I had a great time last year. Uh, so I'm looking forward to just seeing 
uh, everyone's faces again with masks on, of course. Um, <laughs> and yeah, just being out there to be in that lab again and processing samples. As you can see in this picture, that was uh, one of the whale uh, bones that we found during the whale fall. Um, that was a really cool experience to get to process that sample. Um, and we're actually gonna you know, explore again and maybe we'll get um, our hands on some more cool whale bones or something. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a great experience. Um, and actually one of the bone eating worms that we found um, might be a new species. So that would be pretty cool um, to, to uh, be able to get my hands on some of that stuff again. Uh, it's just a great experience to, to have these samples and learn what it's like to process them and who they're going to and what they're gonna be looking at with these samples. Um, it's a really incredible uh, experience for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, speaking of samples, we do have another question on YouTube asking, um, what are some common roadblocks that you have to deal with when collecting samples uh, and kind of performing your experience experiments back in the lab? Are there a lot of roadblocks that you have to face? Yeah, um, I'd imagine so. So I haven't done, um, this is my first field season with microplastics, um, but I can speak to uh, the sampling methods that we, we've done last year on the Nautilus. Uh, sometimes it's just really hard to snag a hold on some of those samples, uh, like sediment samples. It's really hard to get those push cores into the sediment and pull them back up without spilling all the sediment everywhere. Um, and yeah, there could be roadblocks. Um, if I have like potentially like a lot of organic material that I need to digest before I can look at microplastics. Um, I'm sure like, you know, I wanna make sure that I get all of that removed so I can actually see what's going on. Um, and yeah, as I get a hold of all of my uh, protocols and uh, running all of these samples, I'm sure I will run across like a lot of um, different things that I'll need to, little little uh, kinks to work out. Um, oh, and I, I got a request to show this Niskin again. So this will be how I'll be collecting water samples. So this is a 1.7 liter Niskin. Uh, the ROV Hercules has uh, five liter Niskins, which are a bit bigger. Um, but the way this works is both sides, see if I can get it open, open up. Um, and I'll leave them open when I place them, place this into the water. Um, and I'll lower it probably like a meter below the surface of the water. Um, and then I'll send this big weight down the line to sm smack this button here, which will close um, the Niskin, um, collecting the water right there exactly where I wanted it to uh, in the water column. Uh, so we have all these kind of cool tools uh, to help us um, collect all these samples. Um, it's pretty impressive, all the engineers that create these things. Um, it's pretty awesome. So if you're not interested necessarily in science, but engineering, hey, you can still be a part of the Nautilus team because we're looking for engineers too, who are passionate about exploring the deep sea and how we can use new tools to help us do that. Good pitch, I like that one. Uh, <laughs> so we are actually running out of time, but I wanna ask you one last question, Taylor Ann, and that's, you know, I know you are just starting out in this microplastics career and uh, in college in general, now that you're in grad school, but what has been so far your most fascinating or surprising thing about either your study or your time at sea or discovery that you've been a part of? Kind of what's been the most fascinating to you? Uh, I think the most fascinating thing has been the connections that I've been able to make with people. Um, I was featured in National Geographic uh, a few months back, I think actually almost a year ago. Um, and from this feature, uh, so many people started messaging me on on websites like, hey, like I, I read your article and that really inspired me. And like I was thinking about doing marine science and uh, reading your article just really helped me like decide that's what I wanted to do. Um, and just connections like this, like talking to people and just seeing how excited they get, um, just hearing little me talk about science and the things that I'm nerdy and passionate about. Um, I think that's my favorite part. Uh, uh, and then more on the scientific side, uh, definitely the whale fall that we came across last season was probably the coolest thing that I've ever seen. Um, I was asleep when they actually found it and I woke up ready to get on my shift and they're exploring this huge, awesome whale fall. And I'm just like, wow, I can't believe like we found this, like it was the day before uh, we were getting ready to, you know, stop all of our dives and come back to shore. Um, it was the last thing that we came across and it was amazing. It was a great way to end the season. Uh, and I'm looking forward to finding some new great things out this season um, and all the seasons to come if I'm able to come back, which I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were all at OET very proud of your National Geographic feature. And I hope everyone who's watching this can 
go and find that article and read it as well. Uh, it's been great chatting with you today. And I just wanted to give everyone an update on the EV Nautilus's dive schedule. Uh, we are getting ready around noon today to launch our last dive of the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary Expedition. So that'll be on nautiluslive.org. You can watch live uh, that whole entire dive. It is the last one for this expedition that we're on. And then Taylor Ann and a few others will be heading to the ship in a couple of days for our next expedition, which is going to be in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of California. Uh, if you liked today's event, please keep checking back on uh, nautiluslive.org slash education for more of these live events. Our next one will be on October 5th at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And that will be talking about what's next on EV Nautilus and about the next expedition. Uh, so please mark your calendars and come back for that one. And if you're a teacher or a parent with students who are in school right now, or just using our education materials or watching these live events, we'd love to know more about how you're using them, what you're doing with them. Uh, so please tag us on social media with hashtag inspired by Nautilus Live. Uh, we'd love to feature you on our social media as well with how you're using our lessons or our materials that we have or our live stream. So it's been great chatting with you, Taylor Ann, and also connecting with everyone on shore. Uh, please tune back for our next live event. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody.